In this unit, we're going to learn about numerical integration techniques. And this is an incredibly valuable set of tools because there are times that the integration techniques we've learned so far for how to integrate functions manually or analytically do fail us. For example, I've got two examples here. One is a function like e to the x squared, which doesn't yield to any of the methods we've learned. You can't use u substitution or integration by parts or any of the other methods we've learned to integrate that function analytically to find its antiderivative. So we can't do that by hand. There are also cases where we might just have data points. And I've got an example here with discontinuous data. And perhaps we have, for instance, the velocity of an object measured at discrete points in time and we want to measure the total distance traveled and so we could integrate if we had a velocity function but if we don't all we have is discrete points like this we might still want to approximate this integral but we can't integrate analytically however if we can take advantage of some numerical techniques we can solve problems like this so your calculator and any computer algebra system like MATLAB or other software packages have built-in numerical integration techniques and some of them are the ones we're going to talk about here and some of them are more complicated but we'll stick to relatively simple techniques and we're going to learn about two methods to numerically integrate functions but it turns out that all of this is based on something familiar when you first learned about integration, you learned about something called the Riemann sum. The Riemann sum says we can approximate the area under a function, which we know is the same thing as a definite integral. We can approximate this area using rectangles and by including many rectangles that approximate the shape of the curve, we can take these simple geometric figures and find the area for all of these and add them up. And so this is something you've seen in the past and it's something we've even used in the application section of this course where we talked about how to split for instance the work done over a certain distance into small distances and assume it was constant on each discrete interval. That's the idea here. This function here would be like the force function in our work problems. So we can approximate the area using rectangles like this and if you notice how we've drawn it here the width of each rectangle is consistent it's called delta x and then the points where this function is evaluated the points where the rectangles height is measured we're calling x sub k and k can range from 1 up to n for n rectangles. So if we have n rectangles, then delta x will be the total distance from a to b divided by n. So we divide that up into n subintervals. So for instance, if a was 0 and b was 4, and we wanted to divide it into 8 rectangles, delta x would be 0.5 or 1 half. So delta x is simply the distance from a to b divided by n. And then the integral from a to b of this function is approximately equal to the sum where k ranges from 1 up to n of f of x sub k. Because if you notice, each of those rectangles has a height defined by the function at x sub k and then times delta x. And so if k starts at 1, x sub 1 would be like our a value here and then x sub n would be the last rectangle here at the end. So it's important to pay attention to these endpoints but when we get into examples we'll see the details of that and as long as you're careful there isn't too much trouble. 
Now before we go on, notice that this is not exactly equal to the integral. We understand this. There's an approximation here. You can see these areas that are either undercalculated or overcalculated when you use rectangles to approximate. So we understand that there's an approximation. And in this section, we're going to actually quantify this approximation in a few examples. The error here, we can measure if we know what the exact value should be. Now, in practical terms, if we're approximating an integral, chances are we don't know what the exact value is. But for some of the sort of constructed problems in this section, we will be able to measure the exact answer by integrating manually, and then we can compare that to our answer that we get numerically, just to see how well this numerical method does at calculating the integral. So when we talk about error, there are two measurements we use. One is the absolute error, which is the difference between the approximate value and the exact value. And since we're going to call this the absolute error, we're going to take the absolute value of that because we're not so much interested in whether it's an underestimate or an overestimate. We just want to know how far off we are. So we can subtract these two and then take the absolute value. We can take this one step further. Suppose the correct answer, the exact value for an integral, was 1 and we got an answer of 2. That would be pretty bad. The absolute error would be 1. But if the correct answer was 100 and we got 101, we would have that same absolute error of 1, even though, relatively speaking, we were much closer to the correct answer. So it's often more important to talk about the relative error because this scales it based on the size of the correct answer. So in the first case where we got an answer of 2 instead of 1, we were off by 100% from the correct answer versus in the second example when we got 101 for a correct answer of 100 we were only off by 1%. So to scale it we'll just take the absolute error and divide that by the exact value. And we'll use the absolute value here again. All of these errors will end up being positive numbers because again we're not generally concerned about which direction the error occurred in simply how large the error was. And often you'll see relative errors then converted to percentages. So when we calculate it this way, we'll get a decimal value, but we can write that as a percentage if that's convenient. So when we do calculations, if we happen to know what the exact answer should be, we can calculate either the absolute or relative error as we choose to do so. So you'll see that in some of the examples as we go forward. Now, in practice, we generally wouldn't know what the exact value was, and there are ways to estimate or draw bounds on how large the error would be for a given technique. That's a little bit beyond what we want to worry about in this class, but there are ways out there to approximate the error ahead of time or at least draw bounds on it and find how bad it could be for a particular method and a particular function. So we're going to build off of this Riemann sum, this basic case where we draw rectangles and we approximate an integral using the sum of the area of those rectangles. And again, these areas here are simply the height of the rectangle times its width. We're going to take this Riemann sum and extend it to two other rules, one called the midpoint rule and one called the trapezoid rule. And each of these is a technique for approximating an integral numerically. Both of them are based on the basic Riemann sum. They're just slight extensions of it. And so we'll see each one in turn, both are relatively simple, and again, we're 
approximating a complicated geometric shape with a series of simple geometric shapes. The midpoint rule will use a rectangle and the trapezoid rule, as you might guess, will use a trapezoid to approximate an area like this.